Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Mesa City Council study session for the 3rd of May. Uh, all of our council is present. The first item on our agenda is to review the agenda for the May 7th council meeting. So please refer to that document. Um, first several items are liquor license applications and purchase contracts. Um, under agenda item five, I note in particular, this is, uh, council will recall and the public will recall that we have had several discussions in these meetings over the last few months talking about uh, the need for increased staffing in our public safety departments. So agenda item 5H is uh, the, a proposed sales tax, a quarter cent sales tax to fund additional police officers and firefighters. Um, so, council, any, should we leave this on the on the consent agenda, or would it be appropriate for us just to take it off, so that we, the more we talk about this, the better. The more discussion and publicity and conversation about it probably is, is a good idea. So, if if it's all right, I'm going to suggest we take that off the consent agenda, just so that we have another opportunity to talk about it. Everyone feel okay about yes. that? Sure. Great. Um, proceeding through the agenda. Also, the agenda under agenda item seven, uh, A, A through J, are the proposed uh, utility rates. I, again, uh, we've had multiple meetings about this, but Mr. Brady, it'd probably be good to have a, a staff presentation, if not today, then maybe Monday, yep. prior to our council meeting, just so we can again remind everyone of uh, what, what we're doing, what the original suggestion was, what council uh, came back with, and where we've kind of settled on these things. We can do that. And the, that scenario C that the council gave us direction on is included in your backup, but we'll review that one more time on Monday um, before the council meeting, just to go through those in detail again, if that would be appropriate. Okay, does that sound good? Mr. Whitaker. I have one question. On these, all these uh, seven items, are we actually is this the vote that we're taking to increase the rates or is this just the public notice? Is there like another phase before we actually vote on increasing? Uh, Mayor and council member, it's a, it's a two-step process. So there's a resolution and an ordinance. The resolution uh, places the, the increases in the tables with the clerk's office uh, and, and so that they're available to the public, which are also available obviously now on Legistar. And, and then it's introducing the ordinance and then the <coughs> ordinance will come back at the next council meeting council meeting for actual adoption. So this is the actual rate increase. But there'll be a final vote on the 21st? Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I would like to request uh, the entire item seven be taken off consent agenda. Right, so that, yeah, that's items A through J. Yes. Right, okay, so and that. I, I also asked staff to provide a utility rate increase that didn't include the uh, ASU building so that I can see the differences between the rates. I'd like to see a presentation on the utility rates without the uh, cost of the $120 million ASU building included in the presentation on Monday. So, Mayor and Council, we can do that. The question is, would you also like to us include the impact of those investments in downtown? I mean, it's what we right now we've only included the cost. We haven't included the impact, the additional dollars that could be collected because of that. So we can show the cost, which is already included. We can show what rate effect that has. What we haven't included in any scenario to date, and we're gonna get a presentation from staff of the anticipated or the estimated um, economic impact stimulus of having ASU in downtown, which would affect both um, utilities, <coughs> Uh, revenues as well as property tax revenues as well as sales tax revenues. So we could include all that. That would be great. Okay. So would both of those presentations be ready by Monday? Uh, we weren't anticipating doing the economic impact uh, presentations until Thursday. That's when they're scheduled for. Because right. that was a regular, this next study session, that's what we yeah. I And that would have been my understanding as well, but I think Mr. Whitaker's point is he would like to see that in, in, in the context of utility rate conversations, he would like to include the ASU, the economic impact of the ASU building, I believe. So if we link those two issues together, as I think he's suggesting, 
we would need to do it prior to our Monday meeting. I'm going to move into that. Okay. So the city attorney is suggesting we could do that. One way to do it would be to pull these items, seven, what are they, to move them to Thursday as a, in a special council meeting. So they could link the two together. Okay. Does that make sense? Sure. Yeah. We'll take them off Monday. Yeah. I just, I want to make sure that our presentation, I don't, it'd right. be a rush for us to get them ready. We're, they're, I've seen the drafts and I just got handed a draft last night, so I just want a chance to review them. But we could do that Thursday and have the this um, items of on the uh, right. utilities on that same Thursday. It'd just be a special council meeting. Then. I see some heads nodding. I think it, it, it's such yeah. a, a meaty topic. Okay. I would hate to, to rush it on in the, the, the study session on Monday before the council okay. meeting. So let's remove items. Wait, oh, wait, hold on. There's some notice requirements too. We've got to worry about. Is that going to affect it? Are we going to be okay? Yeah, there's one of the reasons we're doing this is it required to give notice for a certain period of time before we can adopt the ordinances. We'll let them keep talking. We'll okay. we'll let you know how that works. Great. We'll, we'll circle back to the issue of uh, item seven on the Monday's agenda. Okay, and continuing. Hey, yes, Mr. Whitaker. Question on five B. I just wasn't sure what that was. I didn't know if anybody could provide some more information on that. Okay. No. Sure. I think this is a fire medical. Can we come forward and explain this one? Is there someone here on 5B? This is approving and authorizing the city manager to enter into an IGA with the Arizona Department of Health okay. Services to receive $25 per child adult to provide immuniza immunization so, services. So our department, yeah. We do that. Yeah, we do. We provide. We've done it for years. Just tell, yeah. this is a good program, Mary. Why don't you yeah. talk a little bit about it? Mayor, members of the council, thank you. This is a program, we've been doing an immunization program for a long time, and the county, we've been, we've been getting grant funds, and so we just work into an agreement where they will give us $25 when we immunize uh, children that are um, uninsured, so we make sure we have enough funding to keep the program going. Thank you. You're welcome, thank you. All right. Uh, are we ready to, is, is staff ready with an answer on the, oh, we we had item seven? They need to look at it. So. We have to look at it. We, it. It might be a situation where we need to leave it on Monday and we continue it to a date specific to the okay. Thursday. So we have to just check because we right. have to look at the As opposed to just pulling provided. it all the way off. Right, okay. gotcha. Okay. So even if, it, if it, even if that's not resolved today on Monday, we'll, we'll, we'll let whether you know, or yeah. not we're going to proceed or continue it, right? Okay, Council, any additional questions? Yes, Mr. Luna. Mayor, there going to, there's going to be a continuance on item 10A and 10B till uh, August 20th, 2018. Just wanted to okay. point that out. Great, thank you. Uh, 10A and 10B, okay, the zoning case that we've been working with the applicant on, uh, we're continuing to have conversations, so that'll be continued. All right. Council, any other questions regarding anything on the agenda for Monday? All right, thank you. Then the next item for this meeting, uh, item two, is to hear a presentation and discuss the departmental budgets for community services, arts and culture, and library services. First up is community services. Ruth, welcome. And welcome to your lovely assistant as well. Didn't mean to exclude you. It's one of the Brady Bunch. <laughs> oh. Good morning, Mayor and Council. Um, my name is Ruth Giese, Community Services Director. I have with me Diane Brady, Animal Control Supervisor. <laughs> Today we're gonna be going um, over some of the activities of community services. Uh, community services is made up of the Housing and Community Development Department, um, Animal Control, Diversity and Neighborhood Outreach, which in includes um, volunteer programs. And our mission is to provide assistance, education, and resources to connect residents with City of Mesa services and programs. Some of the accomplishments that we've had. Throughout the year, council is involved and provides direction on our federal allocations and the application process. One of the many projects of these dollars 
out of the many, project, many projects, three specific developments um, added 127 affordable units for low and moderate income families and households. Here in the upper right um, corner of our slide is a photo of art space. And um, here are the La Mesita apartments and the uh, El Rancho apartments. I'm sorry, Ruth, can you go back to the previous slide? Yes, and I just wanted to show you the pictures. Oh of that. Um, I'm just curious, uh, and this is total just curiosity, but th there was a great uh, group from Carson Junior High that came to our meeting six months ago. Yes. And I see... Uh, There's a photo one of, there. One of the bullet items is Carson Junior. Yes. Mr. Freeman is so old that he went to Carson Junior High, <laughs> uh, <laughs> as did other council members. No, and that is one of our <laughs> accomplishments as well. The last bullet point, fostering um, civic yeah. engagement with Carson Junior High. We actually did go out and meet with them and got a photo of the class because as part of their project, um, we created a video for them and some photos because they're going to a state competition based on the research. So it's really exciting news. So that is a photo of that class. That, oh, that's great. But yeah. Mr. Freeman and I volunteered to go out and, and visit them, and I think we let that slip through the, craps, the cracks. So, <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> that's it. There's, a, there's a button up in the booth, right? <laughs> Rewind. So nobody in this room will, outside of this room will hear that. So I guess the question is, I, if, if we weren't a part of that, then I think we need to circle back with Carson and, and fulfill the promise we made to go and visit their class. And we're happy to help coordinate that because okay. we know all their contacts. Now. Okay, great. Mr. Luna. Uh, Ruth, any way to put that video on your website so that the public can see it? I will double check with that, of course. Okay. I, would, I would do that. Okay, great. Okay. I'm sorry, didn't mean to interrupt. No, Please that's proceed. okay. Um, other accomplishments include um, our housing authority um, with $12 million in funding. Um, it helps serve um, 300 new families to find housing this year and also manages 1,700 vouchers. Our diversity programs continue to grow. We have a new partnership with Benedictine University. They are hosting our indie pop-up film series. And with their help and our social media campaign, we tripled the size of our attendees this year. Uh, we also um, have seen a growth in our Hometown Heroes Banner Program as more residents uh, learn about how they can honor their loved ones through the program who have served in the armed forces. Uh, we continue to work with our external partners such as MLK Celebration Committee to host the MLK Parade. Um, internally, we planned an employee workshop uh, for Latino Town Hall. The panel discussion centered around raising cultural awareness to provide excellent customer service. Uh, the workshop was videotaped and is available on the Learning Center for Employees. Um, and um, I was noting that Lupe Rodriguez, our um, animal control officer, is actually working with the seventh grade Carson Junior High to help them follow through on their state competition. So that's really great news. We will um, be highlighting some performance measures of the Neighborhood Outreach Office as well as the Animal Control Divisions. Our outreach team provides training, mentorship, and guidance to residents. I want to thank Andrea Alicote, Lindsay Belinke, Cynthia Oscura, Bethany Freeland, and James Duty for their passion and dedication to serving the community. In the last year, the, t the team has provided one-on-one -on -one assistance to more than 1,100 residents and has connected with an additional 1,600 people in 85 neighborhoods and community events. The team has launched the new UConnect Mesa program and has held eight events. In addition, neighbor, um, they're streamlining the neighborhood registration program and updating the GIS mapping system so it'll be easier for people to find their neighborhoods. And we'll be adding online resource guides. In addition, uh, we wanted to provide an update on the free little libraries program that came out of the Imagine Mesa campaign. It was a well-liked idea and received an honorable mention during the advisory board presentation. Free Little Libraries is a nationwide initiative to build community through neighborhood book exchanges. Uh, typically, the unit, as seen in this photo, it's a small wooden box, and anyone can take a book or bring a book to share, and it's um, usually in someone's yard. Um, 
The Free Little Library organization is a national one, and we have received permission from them to use their name in promoting our MESA program. The Neighborhood Outreach Office uh, will begin offering a grant program this summer, and we have existing uh, funding for up to six um, <coughs> boxes, and it'll, um, an application will be required, and um, it'll be on a first-come, first-served basis. And um, part, as part of the program, we will register each new library. Oh, did you have a question? Excuse me, Ruth. Yes. Yes. No. Uh, I thought you were finished and moving on to the next slide, and I had a question, but continue. I'll wait. Okay. Uh, just really quickly, um, it'll be beginning in the summer, but as part of it, we will register each new box. And as you can see here, you get um, each box gets a, a plaque that it's registered with the national organization. Ruth, how many, did we look up how many exist today throughout the city? Do you have that number? Yes. So um, right now, just before we're going to start this more formal program, there are about 22 uh, libraries existing now, 18 of them are registered through this national organization. Um, and so we're just going to be adding on to it. So right now you can, what you do is you go in, you type in your zip code, and it kind of shows you which ones are in your neighborhood or not in your neighborhood. So if someone's interested in getting one, we'll want them to check to make sure there's not one already close by. Okay, so we have 22. Yes. And we have funding for an additional how many more? Well, we're going to start off with six, and then we want to garner, um, see how that goes, so and the then we'll like. figure out um, and come back and see what right. we can we do. We kind of wanted to see how much interest there is out there, because the neighbors uh, would have to make the decision to register and put it in their yard, and then they work with, I guess, they and others. Oh, what well, talk about the book, putting the books in. Or, oh, okay. yes, and I meant to mention that, yeah. too. Um, I Mesa Public Library um, has generously, will generously donate to um, add books to these first six libraries, which is great, and then we'll work with them. Um, it, it's a win-win for us and um, getting the library on board as well. Great. Thank you. I'm sorry, I think we have some questions. Oh, yes. Mr. Um, Whittick? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead, it's David. with the library. Is that okay? Yeah. Mine's the library. I, go ahead. Okay. I'm fine. I can well, wait. Actually, We're not going I'm anywhere. I'm just going to ask his question because once you identify the locations, would you let us know so that we can communicate to our residents that this is available? Yes. Well, what happens is that the neighborhood itself is going to work. That's how you, you start make, building those connections because they're, they're going to want to let their own neighborhood know so we can help them with, you know, flyering and, and that way they connect with each other. And that's what we've seen happen is neighbors get to know each other because now that's part of their daily walk or they'll have a stack of books and then each time that they're done with it, they go and they, they get to meet um, their neighbors. And so it's a really great way to establish neighborhood placemaking. But we'll let the council know when we make the decision of the six or those new six new Yes, ones will of be. course, we will. Especially, yeah, especially if it's in your district and we can highlight that and um, kind of maybe get photo op and social media op would be great. Yeah, thank you. I just want to say I love this idea. So how does this, so a citizen has to apply to get one of these put in their yard and then staff makes decisions based on geographic locations or how does that work? Uh, okay, so the cost of building a, um, one of the little libraries is about $250. So what the grant would do is we would provide all the materials to build it, which is about, we estimate about $250, lumber, all the materials. So what we would do is just on a first come, first serve basis, as the applications come in, someone who's gonna have it in their yard, they have to decide, yes, if I, if I get this grant and I get all the materials from the city of Mesa, I commit to building it myself. So that's how it works. And then they can decorate it, they can paint it. Um, however, other opportunities that might exist in the future is we could have volunteers build boxes and then they would be available as well. So there's lots of different options, but it's really up to that resident to commit to building it and then putting it in their yard. Oh. Not the right of way, but in their, on in, their Right, in it's their on their property. And uh, do we have any issues with, uh, or foresee any issues with HOAs trying to stop, uh, or is there any way that we could maybe uh, put something out there so that HOAs can't prevent people from putting these into their yards, or has that been discussed? 
<laughs> no. I'll defer to Mr. Smith. Um, Mayor and Council Member, I, the, I don't think the city can adopt something, but the state uh, has regularly in the last several years has adopted statutes to prevent HOAs from doing certain limitations. It goes back quite a number of years, and uh, probably about 10 years ago when flying the American flag was sort of the first uh, major issue with a HOAs. And there's been a series of legislations. I don't know if these little libraries have been addressed at the state level, but, um, uh, and I don't know if HOAs have uh, put in their CCNRs restrictions on these or not, but that's really a state level issue. Okay. And um, just as a follow up, um, the property owner could seek permission from the HOA ahead of time to have it. Sure, awesome, thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Lerner. I love all these questions about the little well, libraries. Uh, this is really exciting. I think it's yeah. a cool project. Um, I was, and I see Lindsay over here. Is there something, can you do something on next door and let people know this is available? Just to let everyone know, hey, this is a potential in your neighborhood. I and think that's the one good thing that we do a great job of yeah. is getting the word out. Okay, so definitely. Yeah, thank next, you. Next door is a thank great. Thank you, Vice Mayor. It's mm -hmm. a great tool to use for that, and Lindsay does a real good job on yes. that. So, thank you. Any other questions? Okay. I will turn it over to Diane to talk about animal control. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, good morning, Mayor, <laughs> Vice Mayor, and City Council members. Ruth was going to tell you that uh, I am retiring after 27 years, and I was going to tell after. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I needed the lead in. <laughs> Congratulations to Diane. Now what she has announced say? Um, in August she will be retiring after 27 years of service. Yeah, and Thank I you, did. Diane. <laughs> Thank you. I did want to personally thank this council, previous councils, and city staff that um, for all the years of support and guidance. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I want to thank my staff, Shannon, they're small, but they're big. Shannon Lupe and Renee and Alicia and James for all the passion that they show and their hard work and dedication. So down to business. Uh, some of you may or may not know that Mesa has had animal control for a long time, almost longer than me even. And uh, we started out, this was a nationwide mandate to control rabies. And in the beginning, Mesa had their own animal control shelter. It was um, up on the north part of Center and McDowell, near where the present police range is. But after a while, we closed our shelter and we went with Maricopa County Animal Care and Control to do our housing. After, in 1988, the city provided land to the um, county to provide, to build a shelter here in Mesa. So ever since then, we've been working with that facility. And uh, until 2008, our department was under the jurisdiction of the Mesa Police Department. And, uh, but now we're with community services. We presently have three animal control officers. We work Monday through Friday, seven to six. And, um, we do a lot more than just pick up dogs. We do bites, animal cruelty, rescues, wildlife, livestock, um, pretty much anything animal related within the city limits of Mesa. Now that we are um, not under PD anymore, we're, we don't uh, use their dispatchers. We do our own intake of calls and our own dispatching. So our specialist handles that. We get, um, over 2,000 calls a month, and over 550 of those result in an actual dispatch of an officer to go out into the field and do something of some kind. We, are, we have been a role model for other agencies throughout the state and um, even nationwide for many years. And um, our, our, one of our most important goals is to reduce the impact on the police department so they have time to do other items, other projects. And we provide a higher level of customer service than, than um, some agencies because we are a do-it-all package. 
We also try to educate the public on proper animal care, ownership, licensing, and sterilizing. We participate in public events, clinics, schools, businesses, organizations. And um, residents of Mesa love their animals. They really do. And uh, that's evident by the response on social media to our posts. Some of our posts have gone viral. Um, some of the most popular ones were when Officer Lupe Rodriguez received her Exceptional Customer Service Award. Another was um, an at-large giant African sulcata tortoise. And uh, another was raccoons that had been safely removed from a car dealership. They had snuck in on a, a carrier from they don't know where, California, they think, but <laughs> we <laughs> took care of those. And just yesterday, we had an incident, maybe some of you f saw the fire tweets, um, where some pigs were running loose. And uh, <laughs> they, it was right behind a fire station. We didn't call them to help. They came to help. <laughs> and, uh, Sounds they like helped just us. another day in Lehigh. Though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It wasn't Lehigh. <laughs> it wasn't Lehigh. Of course. Of course. <laughs> so, it's a great it, post if you haven't seen it. Yeah, it is. It really is. Fire did so excuse great... me, Don, you said the firefighters were calling help because they couldn't catch pigs? No. <laughs> no. No, we responded on the pigs that were running loose right behind the fire station, and they saw us and came out and helped. Oh, oh. They needed a photo op. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So, and I'll turn it back over to Ruth. Thank you, Diane. <laughs> Thank you, Diane. And again, congratulations on, on 27 years of service. I'll go to our challenges now, just an overview of a couple things. Um, every year we face the budget constraint of trying to forecast the federal funding and what we're going to be getting for the next fiscal year when numbers haven't been finalized. Um, I am happy to report, though, that for next fiscal year, we did get word on Tuesday that our federal of our federal funding allocations, we've received a small increase, and we are coming back to you later this month for final approval. As previously stated, a consideration of working with large CDBG projects is um, balancing uh, a 1.5 timeliness federal expenditure requirement. Um, we're trying, we're always trying to balance having our large capital projects, but making sure that we um, spend in a timely manner. Um, our finance team pays close attention to managing those projects, and our community development team is careful to recommend projects to Marin Council that can be ready to go. In addition, our staff does a great job of keeping up to date with the changing federal rules and deadlines. Those are changing all the time. Um, and although our budget comprises 85% in federal funding, our focus today is under our general fund allocation, specifically in the Animal Control Division. Excuse me, Ruth. Mr. Yes. Luna. Ruth, I had a question. Uh, I know Maricopa County is closing the animal facility yes. shelter yes. on the west part of the town. What is going to happen with that facility? Is that Does that land revert back to the city of Mesa? And uh, yes, what's, so what's what, um, as part of our opportunities and challenges is county services. And um, we are, um, for those people also watching, um, there is discussion um, from Maricopa County that um, there might be a closure in 2019 of our Mesa shelter. We do have plans to meet with the director, Mary Martin. We're going to be meeting face to face to get more information on um, any new developments that she has and ways that we can work together. Um, regardless of the decisions of the county, we also want to make sure that, our, that we're keeping up with the pace of our growing population as well, and we want to be ready to respond at the same high level of service. But yes, we're trying to keep tabs on it. Um, we're hearing different things from different people, especially um, employees that work at the shelter say some things. Um, so that's why we want to have that one-on-one -on -one with the director. Oh, we're bringing that back to council. What, are, what about the land that, that we, well, we own? Well, we don't know if they're actually going to completely vacate the site. Mm -hmm. They may change the 
services they, they may provide there. They to an intake facility type only. They they're not sure yet. <laughs> yeah, but we'll when we know we'll let you, we'll, we'll share that with you. Chris. Thank yes, you. Yes, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Does, Heredia. Does the shelter service all the East Valley or just? Yes, sir. Yeah, does it? Okay. And uh, actually, it's everything east of Center Avenue, Central Center. in Phoenix. Okay. So, so it includes Scottsdale, Scott's Tempe, uh, and... part of Phoenix, all of the East Valley, except for, well, Apache Junction is in Pinal County. So they have their own. So if uh, maybe if we, are the other cities in, engaged in the conversations mm -hmm. as well? Yeah. And it's not just how it, I mean, it certainly impacts animal control, but it also affects the residents. Yeah. If they have to go pick up their pet, um, I mean, today they would come to the location there um, in Mesa, um, but otherwise they may have to go somewhere else. But conversations are with the county. They understand that. Um, um, Supervisor Barney has indicated that they're trying to be sensitive to that. And, and instead of maybe having a full-blown animal control services, um, services that there may be more of a drop-off or pickup services there. So they're still working through it. Um, so we'll we'll keep you up to date, but we, this this still it's still somewhat dynamic in the conversation. It sounds like so, and, it, and you're right. It's not just Mesa. It's it's in Mesa, but it affects uh, many other cities in the East Valley. Yeah, because the other location is where is it? Buckeye. Well, yeah, it's way over on 27th and Buckeye, yeah. 27th Street. Um, other um, other opportunities for animal control. One of the um, uh, items to come out of the Imagine Mesa campaign was was the request to reduce the number of feral cats. That's still a continuing issue on the minds of our residents. Um, so we do want to continue to establish stronger relationships with spay and neuter groups and with veterinary clinics. We want to um, host more spay and neuter free clinics and um, we want to, you know, listen to the innovative, innovative ideas that come um, to us, such as the seventh grade Carson Junior High, when they came to Mayor and Council and presented their ideas of ways that it could help to have all animals microchipped. We'd love to explore that, um, maybe have um, mobile units in the future that could do that for our residents. And for these reasons, uh, we have um, in the fiscal year 1819 budget, um, there is a one additional animal control officer in the budget. This is how we're going to control the feral And um, looking at our five year expense trend by area for general funds, we um, have remained no, consistent that, yeah. over the five years. Sorry, oh. Ruth. <laughs> I, I'm apologizing for the chatter up here. Please, please, okay. please continue. <clears throat> All right. And um, also here um, with our general fund monies, we've remained consistent <coughs> over the last couple of years. And with that, it concludes our presentation. If you have any additional questions, we'd be happy to answer them. Thank you, Mr. Redia. On the animal control, I, I know on the website we have forms that people can su submit uh, complaints or barking or other items. Uh, is it built into CityLink as well? Uh, or can we build it in to CityLink to have folks uh, use that option as we're, well? We're actually, that's the, one of the next phases. CityLink is trying to get all our forms yeah. so they can be um, streamlined, streamlined on there. That. Okay. That's going to take a little while, um, but that is that is a goal of ours to get to that point, yes, to make it so you could use CityLink for that same purpose. Okay. Yes, Mr. Freeman. First of all, I want to thank Diane for her service. Uh, I've worked with her for a number of years, and I've really appreciated her uh, down-to-earth approach in fixing problems and solutions, not only to the feral cat issue, which pops up in all of our districts, maybe not Kevin so much. Do you have feral cats, Kevin? One, one, few. A few. I don't know. <laughs> That's the same with me. But I appreciate you and, and your service again and uh, direction. Um, it's going to be hard to replace you, so I appreciate working with you. Uh, the other thing, I, I, I like the idea. I, I imagine the 2,000 calls per month that you respond to, if you weren't there, they would be deferred to our police department. That's correct. And probably yeah. to fire as well. Yes, so, fire has to respond a lot uh, on a bite or 
a serious situation. So with that said, I mean, that was, those would be, a, you know, 24,000 extra calls a year somebody would have to uptake within our uh, And all the livestock and... Um, well, we're not talking about livestock. <laughs> no. <laughs> there would be issues that code compliance would have to pick up as well. That's true. So, uh, and I appreciate you uh, bringing up the fact we need another animal control officer to help. Because I'm sure, um, you know, 2,000 calls a month is not a, a slack amount, in my opinion. So I appreciate all you do and, and uh, jumping in there and uh, appreciate all your service. Thank you. Thank you. Let me just say amen, uh, Ms. Brady. We really appreciate your great service uh, over the several, couple of decades or more in, in Mesa. So thank you very much. And again, to Mr. Freeman's point, the, this is a great example of civilianization of, of public safety. The, the more programs like this that are relieving calls for service on our police and fire department, the, that saves us a lot of money. So yes. thank you for being uh, so good at your job. We appreciate thank it. Thank you. Other questions, Council? Okay, thank you very much, Ruth. Thank Appreciate you. It. Uh, the next item on our agenda is to hear from the Arts and Cultural Division. Cindy, welcome. Oops, there it is. Thank you. Good morning, Mayor and Council. So nice to see you this morning. We are excited about where we are in the Arts and Culture Department. And just um, a brief reminder of our mission and uh, you can see some of our des key desired outcomes, but our, our mission as a department to strengthen for all our citizens and all uh, of the region really, the creative, social and economic fabric of our community and re region and we seek to do that through inspiring, relevant, engaging, and transformational cultural experiences and cross-sector collaborations. We are um, really very proud of the fact that we feel our programmatic innovation as a department across the department and our reputations for quality have created a strong foundation for future growth. We think we're well positioned for the city to take full advantage of all these amazing resources and assets we provide. And um, really proud that this year, um, in the second year of its existence, um, Expedia's list of the most artistic towns in America included Mesa, Arizona, the first Arizona city on the list. So we're very proud of that. We have many ways we do assessment, but there are three primary performance measures we look at uh, to keep track of how we're doing. Uh, one is participation, another is revenues, which have some relationship to participation, but participation includes free activities as well, and then customer satisfaction. And we'll just t briefly touch on those three. This is a very long trend, trend line showing that um, from 06, 07, when we were considerably smaller in terms of the total service and visitation, um, we have had a nice upward trend line. We are now in sort of a plateau in the 600 to 700,000 annual services range. You will see variances that has a tremendous amount to do with the fact that our programs and our exhibitions and our special events and special grant funded projects vary a fair amount year to year. And so of course, when we have a year where we have a lot of special projects or a big special event that we don't usually have that uh, affects the numbers. But we do think that that 600 to 700,000 is uh, the range that we're in for the current ability to, to serve our capacity to serve the public. Um, but we're very proud of, of, the, of the quantity of service that we're providing. And this is the total for the whole department. Excuse me, Cindy. Mr. Yes. Thompson. Cindy, I, th I think at one point in time I'd asked if, there, if you guys tracked where our visitors are coming from. Can you, are, are you able to do like a scatter, um, scatter graph or, or something that we can see where, because I think there's, um, there may be a, a a portion of our population maybe that we should be marketing to to increase our numbers absolutely because you know, I, I hear a lot about you know the a lot of the 
uh, moms are taking their kids to the Idea Museum. And I mean, I love the Idea Museum, the Natural History Museum. So we have a lot of great things, but is there more that we could be doing um, to, to get people from not just Mesa, but from all around uh, the region? Thank you very much. Yes, we do serve the entire region, and we will be happy to update a GIS map to show you the data we have in that regard. It's actually on my list on my calendar for this, uh, this month. Uh, when the last time we did it, it did show that we serve throughout the region, and I think that it will show that even more so now. Clearly, the most red dots are in the eastern half of the valley, um, but there are red dots representing participants across the valley. Um, we have uh, in, intent to work very hard to expand our service, particularly first and foremost in the parts of Mesa that maybe have lower visitation. So we have conversations underway about how do we do satellite programming out in the neighborhoods and out in the regions of not only Mesa, but the East Valley, but especially Mesa, Mesa where we have lower um, reach because of the distance from our, our facilities. So we, we that's very important to us and we'll be happy to do a GIS map. If, of course, we don't have information for every walk-up customer at the museums or the um, box office. So what we do have are the people that we have in our, in our system. Chris, is there a way that we can ask like Mark Garcia and Visit Mesa to help do some of that marketing? I mean, we, we, we help fund them to to, to market Mesa, so is there a push that we could make on that end as well? <laughs> yes, we could request that through the uh, process because there are dollars that um, we're allocated that we can uh, utilize for city purposes. Um, but and, and they not only, May's not just asking for funding, but he certainly has a lot of um, contracts with um, consultants who do this work anyway right. that are promoting his activity, so maybe we could find a way to join up with that. Yeah, we could explore that, that. I think that would, that would help take some of the pressure off of Cindy and her staff to, to do that. If we can, if we, well, just know, expanding. the wheel's it, already right? invented, we yeah. don't need to reinvent yeah. it. So. Okay, we can, we can approach him about that. Thank you. Revenues are another, uh, another place we look. We have been working really hard to uh, try to shore up both earned and contributed revenue. You'll hear a little bit more about that later. I did want to explain when you look at this chart, there, it's notable that there's this big leap in 1516. And just to remind, that was the year of, of Mesa Art Center's 10th anniversary. And there were quite a number of additional grant sponsorships and programming that increased our revenue that year. Customer satisfaction um, is something we are so proud of and work to, to increase and maintain. We do surveying on an ongoing basis, um, it, it, random sampling at Mesa Art Center for events of all kinds and at both museums. And this is the, these are actually the year to date uh, figures for this year with um, mid 90s uh, per percent of people who are satisfied very satisfied or extremely satisfied. And um, you can see 87% gave us the top two ratings. And that's for both quality of programs and customer service. We have a lot of recent accomplishments. I'm not going to read these all, but I will focus on a few highlights because we are, we are particularly proud of certain aspects of what we do, um, thinking about them in terms of the council strategic initiatives. Placemaking is very important to us. It's in large measure what we're about. And um, we have many initiatives that have been happening this past year and underway to really reinforce the idea that we are a creative place, a destination, a, a place doing really exciting things to engage the populace and the region. And these include everything from Fantastic Planet, which officially opens tomorrow night with our giant uh, sculpt, illuminated sculptures, um, to our, uh, the dino facade that was just unveiled, and working ahead um, on things like the Idea Museum Master Plan and getting community input with Hello Lamppost. All of these things set us apart and make us a unique destination and a place that people really enjoy being. 
We are working to support both the transformation of neighborhoods with our um, activities that reach out into the community and to build a skilled and talented workforce. We're particularly proud of our amazing engagement programs. Um, on average, we're serving uh, 45,000 visits or services through uh, to school children, to youth, and um, another 10,000 uh, services for a lifelong education and engagement. That's just through our engagement programs. You saw the, you know, 600 something thousand total visits of that. Um, that's just the Mesa Arts Center number. And then there are the Idea Museum numbers and natural history as well for the uh, extraordinary deep engagement with the community. We, we are very proud of the fact that we reach everyone from older adults to our new program for um, veterans and active military, which is going really, really well in our pilot year and our uh, project lit, which is the umbrella for all the K through 12 programs at Mac. Um, but also all of our organizations in arts and culture are working really hard through partnerships to make sure we are reaching all different kinds of target audiences and maximizing uh, the impact we can have on our community and a region. We are trying to make sure that we are shored up for the future and that we help uh, create a sustainable economy. We do that through, um, we're currently doing strategic planning at two of our institutions and Idea Museum has been working very hard on a big program they're involved in that looks at operational improvements. And um, very importantly, we're all working uh, on special strategies to build our contributed income base because we believe that's a, a big opportunity with a lot, of, uh, a lot of ways that we have at our disposal to ultimately grow our programs and our services through uh, the donated uh, income. Our top challenges won't come as any surprise with the growth in programs and services that we've been um, having and the opportunities that have presented themselves because we have a lot of folks who want to partner with us. Um, it's a little bit of challenge keeping that pace up with the, the staffing levels and balancing the, that's, that human resource with the uh, number of services. Um, there are some budget pressures from increasing costs, particularly in the area of artist fees that have been going up nationally. And um, then there is an expansion of valley-wide competition for disposable time and money. Everything from, you know, being able to do skydiving inside a building to an aquarium to many new festivals. So we're constantly having to be on our toes to get our message out there and be competitive for people's attention really um, is an, an, you know, an ongoing and growing challenge with fragmentation of media sources. In terms of the highlights of the proposed budget, um, this, is, this is one page that just highlights a few things. Um, I wanted to point out that we are really very devoted to the idea of accessibility in every form um, in terms of serving those with uh, challenges and uh, in, in making sure that we are going above and beyond what the ADA requires, um, creating a sense of welcome for the entire community. Uh, and we have a number of initiatives that are working on that and, and wanted to say we're very proud that Idea and, and uh, Idea Museum and Natural History Museum have um, joined a national initiative to offer low-income families a highly reduced rate with their EBT card so that low-income families no longer have to just rely on a free day when it's very crowded. They can come and have a quality experience um, at other times. We are excited about the opportunities created by the opening of art space, um, the infusion of those uh, art artists into the downtown area and the opportunities for partnering. We have a lot of plans underway with them. And um, at MAC, we think that there's some great potential from bringing our food and beverage um, program and concessions in-house. We believe we'll see over time an increase in earned revenue from that. Um, and up top, you see that we are combining into one customer relations management system across the department, which should have additional opportunities for building the economic base of our institutions. 
This is a five-year history of expenses. Um, they do vary. You'll see a slight jump in 1516 that corresponds to the uh, revenue jump that we talked about earlier, although the, we, the revenue increase was greater than the expense increase that year, which is very nice. We like that. Um, this is the proposed budget for the coming year for the whole department. And I do have another slide that breaks that out by institution, which will probably be most useful to you. But um, you can see that we, have, we do have some increases coming in this year in both expense and revenue overall. Um, the net is the same. Um, we have some places where there have been some increases. And I'll go to the next slide to just touch on what those are because this is the breakout by institution for expense and revenue. And I think that a few things to point out, you'll see that um, MAC has a, a fairly sizable jump of a couple of million there. I wanted to say one of those is that food and beverage before was handled by a vendor, so only the net income was in the budget. And for next year, the cost of expense and the entire gross income are in the budget. So that's a big jump. Um, and we have promised to produce at least the same net income as in the past, and we are poised, we believe, to exceed that. Um, we also had uh, some conversions to keep be compliant with our new temp policy. We had some conversions of temp to city staff that required some augmentation of fees over at um, the studios to cover the expense. So the, again, income and expense are up in those categories. Um, and a number of multi-year grants that are hitting in a bigger way um, this, this coming year. At Natural History, you also see a, a slight decline. That is not really a decline in, um, for the most part, in lower activity. Part of that was that this year there was some funds for the facade project that got transferred over to engineer engineering to make that happen. So those are reflected in there. And um, they also had a number of multi-year grants that are were hitting um, from carryovers in a big way this year that will be expended and those projects will be finished. And I'm happy to um, entertain any questions on this slide or any part of the presentation. But before I do that, I do want to invite all of you and the the public that's watching because the big kickoff celebration for Fantastic Planet, which is, um, which is represented by the image on the left, is tomorrow night from 6 to 10 p.m. Um, throughout downtown, but most of the, uh, the special activities are at um, Mesa Arts Center, and we hope people will come out. It's going to be a great event with food and uh, commissioned dance pieces and fire dancers and food and, music and all that good stuff. And it's a free event. <clears throat> Great. Cindy, so I, I, I've seen some of the Fantastic Planet uh, illuminated <coughs> inflatables uh, over the last couple of nights. So at the MAC, at the Federal <laughs> Building, at the Idea Museum, where, where else? Yes, there's six of them all together. Three at Mesa Art Center. One will be on top of Milano's. On oh, Milano's. And right. one is on the Federal Building, as you mentioned, and one on, on Idea Museum. So there's six of them. And these are for people who don't know. These are aliens from another planet uh, created by the Australian artist Amanda Pereira, and it is the U.S. premiere of this installation. It's been other places in the world, um, other continents, but not to um, our country yet. It's been to Canada. Um, and they are gently and peacefully exploring our fantastic <coughs> planet. They are, they are not going to eat anyone. <laughs> <Great>. <laughs> And, and how long are they visiting our community? And they are. They have invaded our community from tomorrow, May 4th, through May 13th. So all the way through the end of next week. We're proud that they're here for the visit also of the, the National Convention of the American Alliance of Museums. And so we'll be enjoyed and talked about hopefully across the country by museum professionals going back to their cities after their visit here um, over this week. Thank you. Uh, council questions? Great, we're very proud of uh, our museums and uh, Mace Art Center, thank you for the great job. Over great. nearly 700,000 visitors uh, last year, and so very, very good work, congratulations. Thank you very much. You bet. Next item on our agenda is to hear from Library Services. 
Welcome, Heather. Good morning, Mayor, Council. My name is Heather Wolf. I am the library director. And this is Don Kusarak, who's uh, got her other glasses. <laughs> but there we go. Um, we're going to get our um, presentation up and ready. And um, our first slide is our mission statement. And um, while I can tell you that I am very proud of our library staff and how committed they are to providing information um, and guidance um, to our citizens, I thought I would share with you a letter that I received in April from a brand new resident. As an April 2018 arrival in Mesa, I headed to the Red Mountain branch and obtained my library card on Saturday for my initial book checkout. The librarian who provided the card made certain that I was aware of the variety of services available, including ThinkSpot. Over the weekend, I completed or at least thought I had completed, the online training modules for the Burnett Chicago 7 and X-Carve machines, then signed up for the hands-on training at the first opportunity on Monday, April 9th. After arriving very late to the main library due to a GPS glitch, Andrea and Marin went well beyond the call of duty and patiently provided a full hour of clear, coherent, and well-paced instruction after assisting me in resubmitting <coughs> three of the required quizzes which had failed to register online. I am enormously appreciative of their efforts. They demonstrated a superior level of courtesy as well as the concern that the instructional materials were understood and that all customer questions were answered. I very much look forward to using my new set of skills at your awesome ThinkSpot facility. So I was very proud of our staff for um, engaging in that level of service. Our next slide is um, about our services and resources. Our four branches are staffed by 62 full-time and 27 part-time employees <coughs> who help our customers use our resources, find answers, and offer uh, programs. In addition, our wonderful volunteers contributed over 32,000 hours, and that's equal to 15.8 FTEs. They pull holds, deliver items to homebound patrons, and staff our used book sales. In our branches, you will find over 450,000 plus items. Those are books, audiobooks, DVDs, magazines, playaways, and more. And then through our online resources, such as Hoopla, Freegal, and the Greater Phoenix Digital Library, our cardholders have access to over 15 million songs, ebooks, e audiobooks, movies, television episodes, comic books, and graphic novels. We provide internet computers and also resource computers, which include the early literacy computers in the children's rooms, the Macs and the ThinkSpots, and computers with word processing for completing resumes and homework. Some of our key performance measures are um, the next couple of slides. And one of the many performance measures that libraries track is library visits. Over the last couple of years, several service and innovations, several service innovations were implemented to help our customers, which resulted in an expected decrease in visits. And I know it sounds odd to say that we innovated something knowing that it was going to decrease the number of people coming through our doors. But we wanted to address our most frequent complaints. So in May of 2015, we stopped requiring cardholders to come into the library to renew their card on an annual basis. By allowing online card renewal, we knew gate count would decrease. On average, 120,000 cards are issued each year, so we anticipated that approximately 10,000 people <coughs> per month no longer had to visit the library to renew their card. And as you can see here, the total decrease in visits is very close to that 120,000 number. At the same time, you can see that Dobson visits are increasing, and I'll speak to that with our next slide. So unlike um, circulation, which can happen remotely, programs um, draw people into the library. And looking at fiscal year 1617, you can see the numbers went down from the previous fiscal year. This past fiscal year, the library had two programming positions, one adult and one children's, vacant all year. Our programming librarians filled that gap in service as best they could, 
with the result that overall program attendance dropped by just 8% when compared to last fiscal year. And this is amazing when you realize that our staffing level was 80% of what it should have been. The importance of programming, especially children's programming, is evident at Dobson, where program attendance went up 52% um, due to 400 more children attending programs throughout the year. Based on Dobson's success in increasing visits, we know that more early literacy programs are needed at all our locations. So we've worked this year to reallocate our existing um, positions, and we are expanding 10 programming librarians to 12. And instead of five children's library librarians, we're going to have seven and the two additional spots will be allocated to our Red Mountain location and our main location where you saw the biggest decrease in library visitors. All right. So while circulation measures an item that has been lent to a library user, as more formats are added and loan periods change, there are challenges in comparing circulation across peer institutions and even historically in the same system. Since the goal is to buy items that are used multiple times, a useful indicator is the collection turnover rate, and that's what I have illustrated here. Turnover is how often each item in the collection checks out. We can't afford to purchase everything, so we have to be very selective. This graph shows that our acquisitions librarians are doing a consistent job purchasing items that are used at least five times a year, and they are also doing a better job selecting items of interest to our community when you look at the turnover rate of our surrounding um, local libraries. And in case you're wondering, the national average is 3.04, and as you can see, we have a turnover rate of 5.8. So there are a number of recent accomplishments on this slide, but I'd like to highlight just a few. Um, first of all, um, we really appreciate the police department. They provided funds for the library to hire a navigator through Community Bridges. The navigator works at the main library and helps connect those experiencing homelessness with services. Um, she started um, the very beginning, well, the very end of uh, last calendar year. So January 1st through March 31st, our navigator made um, contact with over 100 individuals. She was able to assist 41 and 14 are no longer homeless. Google AdWords is a, non, a, <clears throat> is a program to provide nonprofit organizations with a $10,000 monthly credit. This helps the library show up um, along with paid advertisers when people are searching, the, um, searching Google. So for example, if someone searches used books in Mesa, the library will pop up um, because of course we sell used books. ThinkSpot at Maine opened in March. In two months, we've had almost 1,500 visitors, 300 people have attended programs, 87 people have trained on the equipment, and the equipment has been used more than 225 hours. Those are all output measures, so we surveyed program attendees at five different programs to see if the programs supported their needs. 94% reported that they learned something that was helpful, 93% felt more confident about what they learned, 94% intend to apply what they learned, and 94% were made more aware of resources and services provided by the library. And then finally, um, I'm very honored to say that ThinkSpot was one of the library makerspaces spaces featured in Digital Fab, <coughs> Libraries Advance Entrepreneurship and Innovation at DC Public Library. This event was attended by US congressional staff and library supporters and showcased the important role libraries play in advancing innovation and providing learning opportunities to their communities. So pictures and stories from Mesa Public Library were used to communicate how libraries are transforming communities in the 21st century at that event. Um, like many of the other departments, uh, we do have our challenges. Um, in our case, uh, the hours, population growth, as you heard uh, multiple times <coughs> over the last couple of weeks, and then the distance to library services. <coughs> and thank you to Animal Control. This picture is um, from National Pet Day when they came to the library um, with kittens um, to make everyone happy. So 
Except for Mr. Brady, but he's not here, so. <laughs> so, okay, beginning in 2006, the library reduced hours due to budget reductions. Sunday and late evening hours were the first to go. In 2009, we closed Red Mountain and Dobson on Mondays, further reducing those hours to 39 per week. Since then, we have automated routine tasks, eliminated service points, and reallocated staff. So now all four locations are open Monday through Saturday and offer 54 hours of service per week. And we're doing that with essentially the same staffing level. However, our users still request that we stay open until 9 p.m. and offer Sunday hours as we used to. Um, and as you know, uh, serving our growing community is a challenge. Uh, Mesa um, is growing especially in the southeast. And uh, at the end of last fiscal year, we were asked to investigate the need for library services specifically in Southeast Mesa. The consultant we hired has just finished a facilities need assessment, and we hope to report to you on that on May 21st. I won't share everything in the report um, since we'll be coming to you soon, but the consultant examined the capacity of the library to absorb a significant number of new users. And when we are compared to Chandler, Glendale, and Scottsdale, Mesa has the second highest circulation per capita, the fewest staff, the smallest collection, and the least amount of library space per capita. And then finally, as you can see from our next slide, a facility located near Ellsworth and Ray would help provide better access to library services for residents in Southeast Mesa. And so then that gets us to our proposed capital projects. Uh, since we hope to share the facility needs assessment for Southeast Mesa um, so soon, I'll focus on the smaller projects listed here, uh, what we're calling improvements. So the Dobson location recently celebrated 30 years in 2017, and we recently updated the interior. However, the community is asking for a think spot and more programming and meeting space. The location just has 17,000 square feet compared to uh, 50,000 at the Red Mountain Library and 100,000 at the main branch. So creating flexible programming space will require additional square footage. And while I don't know that we can justify a dinosaur on the facade, <laughs> it would be good to make the entrance more visible. We have a lot of people who use the exit as an entrance. And at the main library, I'm excited to tell you that we've started working with an architect to find ways to improve the children's area. We hope to make the entrance more visible to the actual room. And um, we want to create spaces for the children to explore and play within the children's room. And um, hopefully we can close off the space, still keep it spacious and light, but and close it so that um, the noise and the smaller children stay within the space. Um, and right now, we have the money for the design part of that project. So non-capital investments. Um, Imagine Mesa brought forward um, some feedback to us about our current Code Club programs. And so we are rebranding as Mesa Codes. This will be the umbrella name for all of our coding programs at the library, and we are taking this opportunity to expand the range of ages served. So we will have K-Code, and we plan to use logic games and exercises to help children build cognitive skills that will build you a strong foundation for learning how to code. This program is for ages four to six, and it is specifically designed for children who can't read or who are not confident in their reading. Coding around, um, like K-Code, will be logic games and exercises, um, but these children will need to be able to read instructions. Code Commanders is for ages eight and up, and we've invested in a resource that not only provides lessons for the students, but also tracks their progress, so they can keep track of um, their progress in uh, learning all the various different coding um, skills. We will be working with teens at each branch to gauge interest in code programs for older teens. They right now do not want to come to programs where there's um, tweens. Um, I don't know why, um, but they, they prefer to hang out um, with older kids, um, not the younger kids. Of course, the teens want to hang out with them. 
But um, so we'll be talking with them to figure out what works for them as far as coding programs. And then we do offer the occasional adult coding, coding program. Those have been very popular, but we have not been able to offer them on a consistent, regular basis. So we'll be working with um, some of the attendees at those programs to find out how to do that and support their efforts to learn coding. Although, of course, we do have lynda.com, and you can go online and learn uh, lots on that with your library card. That's all right. A little plug. Um, and then finally, we've had conversations with Parks and the Idea Museum. I think Sunny's still here. And both are interested in partnering with us. Um, we'd like to take Mesa Codes and expand it beyond the libraries. And so we'll be talking to them about ways to do that. And now we're to the budget stuff. This slide is our um, expense trend for five years. And so that you know what makes up each of these two core business practices excuse me, core business practice, core business programs. Um, the library programs and services, um, which is the blue band, is our customer service, our volunteer services, and our um, technology support services. So everything that's forward and public facing. The library resources includes administration and our collection support services. And then our last slide is um, looking at our proposed fiscal year 18-19 budget, and you will see that it is the same as fiscal year 17-18. And we're ready to answer any questions. <clears throat> Sorry, I kind of went fast. Oh, that's great. Thank you very much, Heather. Great job. Council, questions? Mr. Whitaker. I have a couple questions. Have we looked at, um, I know I saw this, I believe I saw this at the main library, but mm -hmm. is there, is it being looked at the other libraries where we carve out a certain piece of space for like coffee shops to be able to give them a subleased area to be able to sell coffee to integrate more people coming to the libraries? So um, currently we are partnering with the Mark Community um, Resources and they have two carts. So there's the one cart at the main library and then we just um, a couple of months ago were able to have another cart um, through our partnership with them at the Red Mountain Library. Um, and so it's a great um, win for both of us. Our patrons are able to um, find affordable coffee inside the building, um, and then it's an opportunity for them to train their um, participants in skills that can help them find jobs. Great. That's awesome. So we're partnering more on the nonprofit side to help the nonprofits integrate. Correct. Um, a number of libraries have experimented over the years with coffee spaces, um, and it is something that is asked for frequently. However, um, finding a partner who can uh, make a living on uh, what they um, the revenue sources within the library building has been a little difficult. So many libraries over the years have opened and closed their um, coffee and lunch areas. Um, the ones that are successful that you see in the Valley um, have been nonprofit um, partnerships. Great. And then the other question I have, um, you see like at the airports now have the, the Best Buy, like almost has like their vending machines where you can like buy things from Best Buy. Mm -hmm. Using that same theory, have we uh, considered partnering with anybody like Barnes & Noble or some of the bigger book retailers to offer, whether it's a vending machine type of scenario or something where maybe the top seller books are placed within the library to form some form of like revenue sharing or income stream? Um, there are sort of vending machine red box ideas um, in libraries, but they're usually stocked with um, library materials. I don't know that I've ever heard of anybody partnering with Amazon or anybody else to offer them on site like that for a purchase. Um, there is um, the ability to, if we don't have an item <coughs> when you're searching online, um, you can suggest it for the library to purchase. Um, and sometimes um, we have the kind of the reverse. Um, so with our Boopsy app, which is the library app um, that you can download to your smartphone, if you go into um, a bookstore and you find a book that you're interested, you can scan the UPC code and see if, and then it'll pop up and tell you if the library owns it, and then you can place a reserve on it and save the money. Okay, great. Yeah, I just know with a lot of the newer books, at times it doesn't seem like the library use, usually has um, 
as many offerings as like if you go to like a Barnes & Noble or mm -hmm. one of the bigger retail chains. So I was just wondering if there's any opportunities there um, to increase the revenue from the library side and then sort of sublease a little bit of area or yeah. something. But I was just throwing out there yeah. as an idea. You can certainly see if there's something out there. Great. Thank you. <laughs> on uh, thank you library cards have we looked into digitizing library cards so somebody can put it in their Apple wallet or something like that like they can use it so again with your um, with the boopsy app you can mm. do things like that, that um, okay. so like I have my children's cards as well as mine because um, while I have my library card memorized because I've had it for 20 years mm -hmm. um, <laughs> um, they, I don't remember their card numbers for some reason. So, um, yeah, I could just put it in my um, app, and then I can check out materials for them. Okay. It, it, so is that wi like widespread? Because people can use that? I, or, or we have been trying to encourage use of our um, app um, because it's a great resource. You can do a okay. lot with it. Um, but uh, it's... The use justifies the cost, but we could definitely get more people to use it. Okay. And then on the Mesa Codes program, mm -hmm. is that a series of program classes, events, or? So those are weekly programs. Weekly programs. For those three age levels that I spoke to. And then, like I said, we'll continue to investigate how we serve the older teens and adults um, in ways that make sense for those audiences. Okay. And those are, are available at? Every library? At or? all three Authors. permanent buildings, um, not at the Express Library because of space considerations. But yes, um, Red Mountain, <laughs> Dobson, and Maine all offer the K code, oh. the um, coding ar around, and the code commanders. If you look on our events um, calendar of events, you'll see those classes all listed. And are we uh, partnering with? The school districts and the nonprofit community. I know there's a couple. So I did um, speak with um, Dr. Don Foley at Mesa Public Schools mm -hmm. uh, to find out what they already offer. She was thrilled that we were expanding the age range and going down to a much younger level. Um, right now, some of the schools do have code clubs. Some teachers are doing things kind of um, ad hoc, yeah. um, but there's nothing really organized. So um, she was just extremely excited that we were doing something because it is a need in our community. Uh, yeah, as I traveled to, throughout the district as for, in the schools, a lot of them had like STEM, STEM classes mm -hmm. built in, uh, and it was all ad hoc through various partnerships that they had or a parent that works at... Uh, uh, Boeing or Intel or something that is uh, enthusiastic of helping folks. So if we can talk to the school districts on maybe combining this, uh, make it a broader program and, and going from there. And also, uh, I mentioned with the nonprofits, there's various nonprofits here in Mesa that do some of this to older uh, adults and, and teens. Um, and then one other suggestion, uh, I don't know, in other cities, uh, I've seen uh, specialized events, like a hack hackathons that uh, kind of bring in uh, a larger audience, maybe build a brand, uh, you know, keep building the brand on these special ev events, and then also sets up them uh, for the future, right, to understand kind of the uh, uh, programs, what it entails, and, and maybe get more interest in, in and helping out on, on this program. So yeah. just a thought. Oh, no, thank you, thank you. Councilman Heredia. Thank you. Additional questions for Heather? Uh, let me I, I, let me just echo some of the compliments on oh, Mr. Freeman. Do you have something to share? <laughs> I was thinking about pulling the trigger on this or not. But okay. uh, Heather, thanks for your comments. I appreciate your work on the navigator part and working with the police department. Uh, with that, funding that, because I think that outreach to the homeless population is very important in our community. So I appreciate it. How is that working? Is that working? I know you gave us some statistics, but is it, how is it received by homeless people when they come in? I mean, is it something that every person has stopped? Maybe you can just share a little bit more so, um, intel about that. Katie is our um, navigator, and she's wonderful. So if you go into the main library, um, she's often out of the building because some of the services she's providing are helping people get missing documentation, so birth certificates, driver's licenses, those sorts of things. And she will transport people and take them to get those things. Um, but she's when she's in the building, 
She's not in her little, what we call the fishbowl. It's a little glass um, office tucked into the corner on the first floor. Um, she's not often in her um, office. She's usually out on the floor. You'll see her with her CBI um, shirt on. And she's engaging with people. She says hello. She checks on them. Um, it's, it's a relationship. You have to build trust. Um, she's had a couple of folks that, you know, she's greeted on a regular basis over the course of weeks who finally say, okay, now I'm ready for help. Um, and she's always so excited when that happens. So she's the right person for the job, for sure. Um, and like I said, it's, it's interesting, um, you know, we weren't really sure how it was going to work, what, how it was going to um, proceed. But I have to say, the, these first three months, um, she's um, engaging them, creating that relationship, letting them know that they are welcome, but there are certain behaviors that are expected. Um, we have a newly revised code of conduct, and again, the police department helped us with that. Um, where we really are focused in, on the safety of all the users in the library. And uh, with our security officers and Katie, we've been having conversations with folks about the new code of conduct. Um, it's not just behavior based, it's also safety based. And um, she's helping us do that again in a very human way and um, offering help um, when they want it. Um, but that's part of it. They have to say they're ready. Thank you. I, I would like a, you know, maybe a six-month report on how it's progressing. So as you come in, maybe you can send it to the mayor and council how, okay. how things are going, the outreach there for that uh, uh, We'd navigation. We'd be glad to do that. I'd like to relay that to our community, especially the districts we serve. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Luna. Heather, great job. Uh, I'm sure that this this week you were really busy with a lot of kids going to your libraries uh, based on what's happening in the state. Um, tell me about your reaching out to some of our homeschool populations. Are you still doing that? Is there more of an uptick on that? I know when I go to the Red Mountain Branch, I see a lot of kids during the day, and I see uh, their parents instructing them at, uh, at Think Spot in specifically. Are you still doing that? Are you doing outreach yeah. on that? So, um, Vice Mayor Luna, uh, yes, we have... Um, both homeschool um, students here during the day, and we also have uh, a number of charter school students here during the day because they don't always have the library facilities at the charter schools. Um, so we see a lot of students during the day, and sometimes, yeah, there's kind of that mental moment where you're thinking, shouldn't they be in school? And then you realize they are. Um, so, uh, we do work with our um, parents. A number of them do use the meeting rooms so that they can meet with other parents who homeschool and um, support each other, both with sharing best practices, but also sometimes somebody has a stronger math skill or somebody has a stronger history skill. And so they will um, work with each other's children in order to help the kids um, uh, grow and develop in those areas when a parent has reached their kind of personal <coughs> need. So um, they, the libraries are, the public libraries are used um, heavily by the homeschool and charter school population. And you're right, ThinkSpot is a particular favorite. And as a follow-up, at the other end of the spectrum, we have a large uh, geriatric population, if you will, on the <laughs> east side of town. Are you working with some of those communities to bring them into the library and to offer them courses? I know that you were offering them some uh, how do you, how do get how to get on the internet and how to do email? Are you still doing that at ThinkSpot? Yeah. So, um, Vice Mayor Luna, the uh, our senior population uh, is uh, part of our digital literacy efforts. Um, we are reaching out to the senior population. Um, one of the uh, performance measures I did not report on is outreach, um, and our librarians go out of the building a lot. We don't get to count those as program attendance based on the state library definition of programs. However, um, we are at Sunland Village. We are at the new Eastmark um, Encore um, facility. We are at Dreamland Villas. We are at Leisure World. And we are presenting to large groups, uh, sometimes 100 or more people, about library services. Um, in fact, the letter I read was from a new um, resident at Leisure World. 
And um, so that is definitely a way we're getting the word out. Um, we're trying to educate them um, on what the libraries have to offer. Um, some still want the traditional books, but many have received Kindles and uh, Nooks from their family members and are seeking our help in using those items. And so we do offer Hotspot, um, which is one-on-one -on -one individualized help, or you can just come to the desk and we'll help you. Um, and then uh, we're also really proud of things like lynda.com and we want them to know <coughs> that they can educate themselves at home by using things like <coughs> lynda.com. So, um, yeah. Sorry, I can go on forever. <laughs> no, great. Other questions? Uh, I just want to say uh, amen again to some of the great the compliments you've received. Uh, the Mesa Codes uh, project, I think, is very exciting. Love to see that grow. Uh, and I, I know you mentioned that you have some funding in your budget for design uh, rel relative to maybe uh, in, in increasing the children's museum or children's library uh, uh, facilities and I just want to reiterate some concerns I've expressed in the past of complaints that I've heard and I'm sure you have about some families with young children feeling a little bit intimidated with some of the other kind of general population in the library and so I, I think those are two very legitimate missions that we are need to embrace and you are so you know, again kudos to the way you're working with the navigator program and and uh, welcoming uh, all parts of our society to the library that's that's great. Please continue to do that. But we need to find a way also just to make sure that young families don't feel intimidated, and that they, the, the the early le uh, literacy mission of the of the library isn't compromised by uh, servicing all of the population of our community. So I, I would be supportive of of not just design, but implement you know uh, some additional funding to take it to the next level. Uh, I, I hate to see us wait a generation and, and have kids <coughs> kids that aren't fully engaged in the library because they feel their parents feel a little intimidated in taking them to the library. Uh, so uh, I'll I'll lobby for additional <laughs> funding to see that happen sooner than later. Um, thank you, Mayor. But thank you for what you're doing. Great job. Thank you, Mayor. Yes, Mr. Whitaker. I just want to second what the mayor said, and I think that um, one of our key performance metrics moving forward. Uh, should be a question that you ask parents. Do you feel safe leaving your child at the library? And I think that question will help us understand um, how well we're doing in that regard. Um, so I just want to reiterate, you know, I, as a child, I went to the library all the time by myself. It was one of my favorite places in total geek, if you didn't notice. So. Uh, but so I think that it's imperative that our children have a place like that to go to for, for the future. So. However, we have to be careful because um, children under the age of 10 are, um, by law, um, need to have a parent um, nearby. So, um, I, you know, in the library, it's okay to have them wander away, but we want the parent to be in the building, um, not, uh, I, I know, I, I was at the library, um, I, and I walked quite a ways um, every Saturday in order to get to the library. So I, I know what you mean, but times have changed. Um, and it's, you know, sadly, it's not just the person who looks homeless who is possibly a threat to an unattended child. So we, um, we do ask that parents be um, careful with their children whenever they're in a public place, whether it's the library or anywhere else. Great. Thank you. Carrie. Uh, Mayor, Council, um, today is the conclusion of our formal um, department presentation. So our first question to you, is there any other um, departments that you are interested in, in coming forward? Candace, next week, is uh, will be coming with a presentation <coughs> on uh, the budget wrap-up, talking about the, the um, decisions, the funding decisions over the last couple of months, give you one last um, look at some of those decisions and get your input before we place it on the agenda. But we just wanted to check. Not every department presented over the last couple of months. We took the, some of the bigger departments or those that had some program changes or uh, modifications. So if there is anything that we're missing that you're interested, we're happy to schedule that for um, for next week. But if not, um, we'll have the, the budget um, wrap up next week. Um, I know there's a presentation scheduled for the economic um, investment fund next week. Um, but as far as department presentations, have we missed anything that you would like to, to see? Council, any, okay. any additional presentations you'd like to see before we 
progress? Have we heard from all the biggest departments as a percentage of yeah, the budget? Have, yeah, you have. You have, yep. yep. Okay. Have. Great. Yeah, thank okay. you. It was okay. very informative. Okay, great. All right, the next uh, agenda item we have is item three here, reports on meetings and conferences attended. Council, anything you'd like to share with us? Yes, Mr. Luna. Uh, just real quick, uh, last week I had the opportunity to go to Chicago through the National League of Cities, vice mayors and council presidents. Uh, what I learned from that is that we're, we run our government quite efficiently. Uh, they talked about the council meetings, how long they lasted, and uh, we do a great job. So kudos to the way we work as a city council and to its staff. Great. Thank you. Mr. Heredia. Real quick, yeah, I just want to thank uh, Mesa Fire, Police, uh, Parks and Rec, and uh, Rhodes Junior High. We had our Saturday, our our uh, April spring blast uh, at Rose Junior High, and uh, we have tremendous turnout. Also, thank the mayor and Councilman Glover uh, for attending. Uh, it was a great event, and uh, thanks for everybody that helped out, and I uh, appreciate it. Thank you. That was a great event, and people were really excited to be at the swimming pool. It was yeah. 90, almost nearly yeah. 100 degrees, and that place was crawling with people. It was fun to see. Uh, other announcements? Well, uh, before we get to announcements, and uh, just on reports and conferences, I, I'm going to say that I had the opportunity, I can't remember if it was yesterday or day before, to go uh, visit uh, the Eagles uh, Rec Center, mm -hmm. where the city has been working with Mesa Public Schools uh, to provide programming for, for kids you know, during the Red for Ed walkout. Uh, it, was a, it was a great experience to, to be there. I, I had, had a chance to talk with some Mesa Public Schools personnel as well, and they uh, brought up the point that this is, in some ways has been a, a valuable training experience because in the future, if there is some sort of natural disaster or fill in the blank some reason that, that we need to mobilize the resources of the community and work with the schools to provide programming or a place for people, and particularly children, to go, uh, this has been an, a valuable experience and, and things that we've learned from. So uh, there were a lot of really happy kids. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a, a lot of adult supervision, a lot of, uh, it wasn't just park a kid in front of a screen. It was some very engaged programming that was going on. Uh, so I just, congratulations to our staff for meeting that challenge okay. so well. Uh, hopefully, I, I think I, I think we all saw the governor in the early hours of this morning signed a, a, a bill that I hope will put an end to that uh, standoff that we've been experiencing. Uh, so I, I think I, I can't make any announcements for the schools, but I, I think that might be behind us. But whether it is or it isn't, I just want to say thank you to the Mesa, Mesa City of Mesa folks and the Mesa Public Schools folks that came together so well uh, during that period of time. Um, Next item is schedule of future meetings and general information. Oh, I'm sorry. We want to hear an announcement from Mr. Yeah, we, uh, we have a few announcements. Just for five, I, I will be at Food Truck Friday tomorrow evening. And, uh, and then I have a great event this Saturday morning. And Clyde, would you roll the video? This is Vice Mayor David Luna requesting flight clearance from Falcon Field Airport. on Saturday, May 5th at 7.30 a.m. at the Falcon Field Terminal Building. See you there. So I want to thank uh, Randy Policar for that wonderful <laughs> video announcement. So I invite everybody in District 5 or anyone else that wants to go to Luna Landing Free Breakfast on Saturday at uh, Falcon Field Terminal. Also, on Saturday evening, we have free movies. It's called Ride in the Movies at the Park, and it's sponsored by Mesa Bike and Pedal Program. And we're going to be there uh, working on emojis, because that's emojis we're going to be uh, working on and watching. And so I've got 
uh, my, my fellow council member who's going to demonstrate. If, try it if you can get a wide shot. And there you go, and you got Mr. Pombier. So if you want to come and learn how to make an emoji while watching the movie, uh, please come by. And my, my assistant, Marisa, thank you for doing that. She'll be there to teach kids how to make emojis. So, see, so it's a busy weekend in District 5. That's great. <laughs> thank you. That's great. Did, have you studied uh, helicopter piloting for quite a while, or did you just like spend the night at an American uh, Hilton Express? Or? I will never tell. Okay. Well, <laughs> that's impressive. Thank you. Holiday Inn, thank you. Um, other uh, announcements? If not, Ms. Kent, uh, help us with our schedule. The Mesa Police Officer Memorial Service. Um, the ceremony will take place in front of the memorial, in front of the main station at 130 North Ropeson, and everyone's welcome to attend at 5 o'clock this evening. And you mentioned um, the two events already. We have alien invasions tomorrow. We got lunar landings on, on Saturday, so it's going to be a busy weekend. And then the uh, next study session in the council meeting will be Monday the 7th. And that's it. Okay. Thank you. If there's nothing else, is there a motion to adjourn this meeting? Thank you, Mr. Freeman. All in favor, please say aye. 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 We are adjourned.